Murray on what number we are. Our fifth installment of the Duane L. Ford Lecture Series inaugural year. You guys are part of a treat this year. Well, every year of seminar is a treat, actually, because we love to learn about chemistry in every opportunity, right? Yes. So today we have a special guest, and I told my students about you uh, this week. Um, we have uh, Deborah Blum coming to us, and she is a, a writer of science. So um, professor of journalism, is that right? Well, I was a professor of journalism at the University of Wisconsin. I'm okay. no longer a professor. <laughs> okay. okay. I keep having that University of Wisconsin because I read your book, The Poisoner's Handbook. So um, I have recommended this to students um, as young as seventh and eighth graders when I have, I have taught a class of seventh and eighth graders. And, you know, everybody likes to talk about uh, solving a mystery. And so I introduced them to, well, this is how chemistry was used. And this is a great book to get people excited about, oh, that's neat. I want to learn more about that. So I'd like to thank you for that very interesting book that I read and that I point you guys to. And so today we get to hear from the author of The Poisoner's Handbook. And uh, so today we'll hear from Deborah Blum, who tells us about The Poisoner's Guide to Communicating Chemistry. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's great to be here, uh, digitally anyway. Uh, so as, as you mentioned, I used to be a professor of journalism at the University of Wisconsin, and I'm currently at MIT. I'm director of the Night Science Journalism Program here. Um, but I still do a lot of writing and communicating about chemistry. I have a blog temporarily on hold for the New York Times called Poison Pan. I spent about two years blogging about chemistry and toxicology at Wired. Um, and the book I'm working on now is actually about food chemistry, less homicidal than Poisoner's Handbook. So it, it's a sort of ongoing focus and fascination for me. Um, but this particular talk I call the Poisoner's Guide for to Communicating Chemistry because it allows me to both talk about an area of chemistry that interests me and to uh, talk about some of the ways that writers like myself try to pull people into stories of science when they might not actually be that interested in science. And I think that probably the most important part of that is uh, thinking about audience. I um, am a longtime science writer. I'm a former president of the National Association of Science Writers. I'm a former board member of the World Federation of Science Journalists. So I spent a lot of my career thinking about how do I tell a story that is going to pull someone into a, a thinking about science that doesn't care about science. For the most part, although I write occasionally for Scientific American, um, my audience is that audience. So I think of it as the audience that's not around the campfire. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is how I try to do that. I want you to think about chemistry, even though you don't think chemistry is cool. Um, and I do talk about this to chemists. I gave a talk about this at the national meeting of the American Chemical Society uh, the summer, in fact, but uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about it more generally here, and it's a talk pretty much based on the book, and, and probably one of the easiest ways for me to start with this is this is the cover of the book I wrote, The Poisoner Sound Book, um, and I want you to particularly notice that the subtitle of this book is Murder and the Birth of Forensic Medicine in jazz age new york uh, i mean i love the cover it's got a test tube which is a moon over new york city but it's really the subtitle there in the med in the old medicine label that kind of leads me to some of my other points although you'll see that they didn't mess around with this when they did the film on pbs they <laughs> did the Poisoner's Handbook like this, and they just listed poisons as a toe tag. So, you know, very different image effect 
this is what I wanted to show you. Uh, if you look at this, you'll see it says a true tale of chemistry, murder, and Jazz Stage New York. And the reason that I wanted to bring that up is because when I wrote the book, and in fact, when I sold the book to my, my editor at Penguin Press, uh, this was the subtitle I sold the book with, and I loved this subtitle. I and 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 I actually got very smug about it in a kind of, I love chemistry, and I do love chemistry. I was a chemistry major when I started out in college. I still find it the most fascinating and beautiful and fundamental of all sciences. Uh, I'm always trying to sneak it into the way I tell a story. Uh, and when I sold the, uh, you know, sold the book and got a contract for this one, it, my agent basically said to me, you've been talking about writing a book about chemistry for 10 years, just get it over with. And so when I sold this book, it had this subtitle, The Poisoner's Handbook, because the book is a handbook of poisons. Uh, the book is a handbook of poisons and the story of these pioneering forensic toxicologists. Uh, and I was just so impressed with myself. And this went almost all the way to publication. And what happened was that the sales force at Penguin said, no, you cannot use that as a subtitle. You can't use it as a subtitle because if you put chemistry on the cover of your book, no one will buy it. And so you have to change it. And so this was one of the biggest arguments I actually had with my editor. And as you probably saw from the actual cover of the book, I lost. Everyone agreed that we would lose readers if we put chemistry on the cover. And I and I was really unhappy about this and complained about it endlessly, as I want to do to anyone who would listen. And eventually, I complained so loudly that it became the centerpiece of a piece in This is Nature Chemistry, the journal Nature Chemistry, talking about the difficulties of communicating chemistry with the public and using this issue of the subtitle of my book as an example of the fact that many people just hear the word chemistry and they sort of flee the room. And there are other examples of this, obviously, besides my book. Um, if you go onto Google, this is a screenshot, and you go chemistry is search, you'll see I flagged a couple of the answers here. Chemistry is hard. Chemistry is so hard. Chemistry is boring. Chemistry is difficult, all in that top 10 list. So that you get that is sort of one of the major reactions to just chemistry is. And the way I've started to think about it is something like this. If you put yourself back, not that your typical high school teacher looks like this, but if you sort of put yourself back in a, a high school chemistry classroom and, and in the good old days where people really did use these chalkboards, you had your professor standing up there and talking about chemistry. If you knew anything about chemistry, if you were an environmental reporter like me, you would look at these chemical uh, formulas up here and you would recognize that this is a lecture about air pollution, right? Down there in the lower corner, you see ozone. And next to ozone, you see methane. And if I go up a little bit uh, higher, I'll see sulfur dioxide. And over here, just above the scientist's hand, you see nitrogen oxides, right? All these different constituents that are problems in air pollution. But that's not what someone who's not interested in chemistry or knows nothing about it see. They see this incomprehensible uh, series of letters and numbers. They quit listening, they turn away, and what they don't see is really what that globe shows you, which is a very polluted atmosphere circling the planet. And if I pick a single one of these, I pick carbon monoxide and I put this up, I'm going to get even less of a, okay, I get what's going on here kind of reaction. A lot of times as journalists, what we'll do is we'll look for a story that has some natural theater to it and, and at least try to introduce our subject. And I'm going to stick with carbon monoxide for a while because that makes an interesting point for me in the way I like to tell stories. So 
carbon monoxide, right? This is uh, actually from a high school in Illinois. They had a huge CO leak from their furnace. They had to evacuate here in the rain. And the fire department came in and was were blowing fans to try to get the CO out of the building. So a lot of times as journalists, if we're going to write about something like carbon monoxide, we forget the chemistry and we'll just do, you know, the theater and the drama and the catastrophe. So I thought about this a lot. I, I find poisonous compounds, and I should tell you this, really fascinating in a chemical sense. In this, in, in this way, which is also the way I think about it as a reporter who writes a lot about environmental contamination. And if you looked at Poison Pen in the New York Times, that's primarily not this homicidal kind of thing that is featured in Poisoner's Handbook so much, but is a lot about environmental chemistry. But poisonous compounds are really interesting to me in this sense. I mean, everything's chemistry. We're collect we're chemistry. We're, we're built of chemical compounds ourselves. I'm sitting here inhaling chemical compounds. I drink them and eat them every day. And most of those compounds do very little harm. So the compounds that are dangerous are really uniquely interesting. They're able to uh, uh, figure out locks and keys and living systems and do harm, right? They're, I, and when I animate them in a science writer sense, not a scientist sense, I think of them as uniquely clever, deceptive and clever chemical compounds. And that was really one of the things I was thinking about when I wrote the book. So to just tell you, to give you an example of this, I'm actually going to take you back to the time of the book. Uh, this is 1918 New York City. If you uh, have been in New York City recently, you know it doesn't look that much like this anymore. Uh, and one of the reasons is they no longer run these elevated trains. This is the Third Avenue Elevated, which is long gone. Um, and 1918 is a really interesting year to me in the way I think about uh, forensic toxicology and actually forensic medicine in the United States entirely. And to give you an example of this, this is from the files of the New York City Municipal Archives. And this is a, a, a murder, obviously. Um, it's a statement killing, is what I think of it. This was a gangster killing in Brooklyn. Um, someone had gone up against a particular gang. They ended up in this pipe. It sends a message, don't mess with us. Uh, people, as you, if you look right in the back of that picture, you'll see a crowd of people getting that message. Um, and what you see here, the man, the sort of heavy set guy in the fedora is a detective, right? What you won't see there is any forensic scientist because they didn't work for New York or really any other city in 1918. New York City did not have a medical examiner's office as this year started. They had a politically appointed coroner's office and that politically appointed coroner's office uh, did not have to include any scientists and often did it, did not. And if you look at the list of who was a coroner, it, you will find that in this time period, the people who were, were determining cause of death were lawyers and milkmen and sign painters and bakers and funeral home operators and almost never anyone with any scientific training. They were people who had done a favor for the a political machine that was called Tammany Hall that ran New York City at that time. And so the police had actually specifically started saying, do not send any coroners or any scientists to our crime schemes because they always screw it up. And in fact, they did. They almost, they either routinely got things wrong or they sold the cause of death, right? It was a very corrupt system and you could buy cause of death if, if you wanted. And so in this year, 1918, the city of New York actually published a report stating, I, I wouldn't have stated this publicly, but they did, that the clever poisoner could operate with impunity in New York City. And in the same year, this photo is later, uh, the state of New York actually said to the city, you're a, a public embarrassment and you have to have a medical examiner and you have to have trained scientists and you have to keep 
sorry, can't say that, quit selling cause of death. And so they forced them to hire the first medical examiner in New York City. He's the man sitting down with a beard, kind of looking out the window, and his name is Charles Norris. And looking over his shoulder is Alexander Gettler, who was literally the first forensic toxicologist ever to work uh, for any city in the United States. And between the two of them, they fundamentally, Norris was a pathologist, not a toxicologist, but he believed wholly that chemical detection was part of solving crimes. And these guys really wrote the books on the forensic toxicology created what you might think of as our CSI age today. And Gettler standing there in the background, among other things, was the first person in the world to be able to figure out if someone was uh, uh, drunk at time of death. And it took him 6,000 brains uh, before he actually knew how to do that. He published that in 1930, the year of this photograph, and New York was, in fact, the only place in the world where they even had the equipment to tell if someone was driving drunk um, at, at, and drunk at time of death. So part of the problem, I'm going to run through this fairly quickly, is that there are a ton of very poisonous things on the market with very little good science to understand them and almost no science in the 19th century in particular to tell if, if these poisons are even in a dead body. Arsenic trioxide here is one of my favorites. Very poisonous, um, tasteless and odorless, so it's a great homicidal poison. And until we knew more about it, was pretty effectively could mimic uh, a natural illness and was sold everywhere. So arsenic was used a lot in cosmetics uh, and often advertised as harmless. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Here's another one, perfectly harmless uh, arsenic. It's the only safe French preparation of arsenic you'll see down at the bottom. And what this meant is that anyone could get their hands on this very poisonous thing. They never left a trace. There were no tests to find arsenic in a body. And so during the 19th century in particular, arsenic was known as the inheritance powder because it was used so frequently and so many people got away with using it to kill other people. And that changed in the mid 19th century. There was a very primitive test, which there's, this is a cartoon of it called the Marsh test, which involved mincing up the stomach of the victim and adding acid and distilling that into a vapor. And when the vapor cooled there on that upside down test tube, if there was arsenic in the material, it would form what's called an arsenic mirror, a kind of dark, shiny layer. And if they saw that dark, shiny layer, that was considered evidence that arsenic had been used to kill the person. But as you can imagine, this was pretty iffy um, and, uh, and increasingly refined. But at the same time, many other poisons start flooding the market. Poisoners start using more plant poisons after this, this kind of test is developed. And then you have the Industrial Revolution, and it leads me to this particular story. And to give you an example of how this works, I want to ask you for a minute to be forensic chemists back in the early 20th century, and I'm going to see if you can sort of mentally solve a crime I'm going to lay out for you. And if you know anything about the history of New York, you know that this is a crime that occurred in a tenement house district in New York. Uh, this is the Lower East Side of Manhattan uh, in the early 20s. Tenement houses were provided homes to the very poor blue collar workforce of the time, mostly immigrants. Uh, they packed lots and lots of families into very small places. Um, they were very poorly equipped, actually apartments. This is, you can actually see this room today. This is the Tenement House Museum in New York City um, today. And this, but this gives you an, what I want you to see is the kind of feel of the place. They were often had peeling walls and splintered floors. And what you see there is a fitting for 
uh, a gas heater. There was almost never electricity in these tenement houses in the 1920s. There's kind of a myth that by, you know, the early 20th century, we were all Edison and electric light everywhere, but that was really if you had money. And the primary fuel for poor places like this was something called illuminating gas. <coughs> which you see illustrating the light here in a kind of happy middle class way. Um, illuminating gas uh, was called bec that because it was mainly used for lighting, but it was used for heating. It was used for refrigerators and stoves and in furnaces. And it was uh, a fairly dangerous gas, and it's, which is not why it's no longer used, made from coal. And its two primary constituents were hydrogen, so it was explosive. If you had an illuminating gas leak and let, lit a cigarette, people often blew up themselves and their apartments. And it was poisonous. It had carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide is an extremely efficient poison gas. So in the case we are about to solve, this is another uh, slide from the New York City Municipal Archives in a tenement house. This is not perfect for the story I want to tell because in my story, there is no body huddled in front of the front of uh, the door of the apartment as there is here. But imagine yourself, the police call you, you're called to this apartment. Uh, you walk down the hall and open the door, and you're going to walk into a room very much like I showed you. Uh, it's very poor. The walls are peeling. The floors are splintered. There's only gas lighting. And it's clear there's been an illuminating gas leak because the police are opening up the windows and trying to air out the apartment. And when you go through the front room into the back bedroom, you see that this a broken fitting from one of the lights on the wall and you see there um, the body of a young woman who has been dead for some time and it's very obvious that she died sometime hours earlier because she's stiff and she's cold and she's pale and you look at this uh, body and you take one look at it and as a forensic chemist you say uh, no, this could not possibly be an illuminating gas death. Does anyone who hasn't read the book or isn't a forensic toxicologist know why that would be? And actually, lots of people in chemistry departments don't know this. This is a forensic chemistry uh, kind of answer. So the thing is that this young woman, if she had been killed by carbon monoxide and illuminating gas, should not have been pale. She should have been pink. Why is that? Because when you inhale carbon monoxide, uh, what happens is you have a protein in your blood, uh, a metalloprotein, hemoglobin, that serves to carry oxygen in your bloodstream. And oxygen has an affinity for uh, hemoglobin, but the bond, but carbon monoxide it has a much stronger bond. It's about 300 times stronger, so it effectively muscles the oxygen out of your bloodstream. You're, it just can't attach and be carried. Carbon monoxide then being a kind of chemical suffocation. And so when this happens, this particular bond between the hemoglobin and the carbon monoxide is so strong, it actually alters the color of the blood. It intensifies the red-pink color of the blood. And that is such a profound effect that even after someone dies of a carbon monoxide poisoning, their skin will kind of flush pink. And the people will actually talk sometimes about a healthy looking corpse after a carbon monoxide death. So you know from seeing this pale young woman that she couldn't have died of carbon monoxide poisoning. In this case, they took the body back to the morgue. They see that uh, they do a blood draw. Sure enough, they don't find carbon monoxide saturation in the blood, but they find saturation of another gas, carbon dioxide. Anyone here knows what that tells us? So if you think about the way we exhale, we breathe, we inhale oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide. But if you're not able to exhale, right, you're unable to exhale and get that gas out, it's the levels of carbon dioxide are going to rise in your blood. And so a high level of carbon dioxide in the blood is often an indicator of asphyxiation. 
some kind of shutdown of your ability to breathe in, breathe out. And in this case, it's an indicator. Uh, it can be strangulation. It can be suffocation. There are a few other things, but primarily if you're doing pathology, that's what it would be. So in this case, after they found the high level of uh, carbon dioxide, this will show you what a CSI world looked like in 1923. They took a closer look at the body. And if you can look at this autopsy sketch and look at what would essentially be the back of this poor young woman's neck, you'll see abrasion one, abrasion two, abrasion three, four, five, four or all of these different abrasions on the body, that's actually the bruising made by her husband's hands, thumbprints and fingerprints on the back of her neck as he suffocated her. And after they did that and called him in, he confessed to this murder. And I love this story, I really do, because it's such a wonderful example of using chemistry to solve a crime. This is really chemical detective work. And this happens in 1923, only five years after that slide I showed you in which scientists were barred from the scene. And it's actually part of a kind of a tipping point change in the history of forensic toxicology in which you see a change in the criminal justice system and you see scientists move forward with the police in solving crimes and, and this sort of landscape that leads us to where we are today. There, and I put this up there not because I'm going to go through all these 1920 poisons, but to make the case that you can run this same kind of analysis with toxicity and murder and, and covers up of crimes with almost any of these other compounds from the 1920s. And Corrosive sublimate there, which is another name for mercury bichloride, actually figures in some very interesting murders and crimes, you know, in my book and elsewhere and actually in Hollywood, which I do not have time to go into. Um, and I, and I want to make a couple of quick closing points. I know you want some time for questions. Uh, one is that one of the pleasures for a writer like me, when you go back in history like this, is to find these two scientists, they're civil servants. They are underpaid civil servants working, as you can see, in a very basic laboratory in a city. And they're able to, through absolute determination and dedication, to change the system in profound ways that reflect here today. And so it's really a pleasure as a writer to be able to bring these guys back to life. And if you watch, um, the film of this is now on Netflix. If you watch the film, they have some fantastic, uh, you know, theatrical recreations of some of the interactions between these two guys. Um, they actually filmed a laboratory in an abandoned psychiatric hospital in Prague. Uh, so that they could get the 1920s feel. And they bought 1920s equipment for all the scenes. That's so really amazing to watch. If we eventually can tell these stories in a way that makes people say chemistry is really cool, it's really compelling, I, I want to know this, please tell me more, then eventually this, I hope, will become this. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have before we run out of time. Okay, so we'll take questions. Remember to state your name. <laughs> okay, we got lots of hands. Uh, hi, my name's Gabriel. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned both arsenic and carbon monoxide, but I know that cyanide was used extensively during World War II as a kind mm -hmm. of untraceable poison. Uh, do you know any ways to detect cyanide in a body? Yeah, that's a great question question. There was a really, uh, and I have a whole cyanide chapter in my book as well. I mean, cyanide is a, uh, one, uh, another very, very, very efficient fast-acting poison, right? Um, there was a really great murder case. I know I sound a little creepy when I say this, uh, but there, <laughs> cyanide leaves some fairly telltale marks, right? It causes a, uh, it's a fast-acting poison. It causes Another kind, it can cause also a kind of 
uh, chemical suffocation. You can get like a red modeling of the skin. Um, you can go into convulsions. You can get, it's a corrosive. Uh, if you swallow it as a cyanide salt, so you can actually get some bleeding from the mouth with a cyanide poisoning. It's not an invisible poison. So there are telltale signs if you're paying attention. Um, but just to give you a kind of interesting chemical example, uh, a couple, uh, man, this was maybe a year, year and a half ago. There was a doctor at the University of Pittsburgh. I don't know if you saw any of this news coverage. He killed his wife, who was also a researcher at the University of Pittsburgh with cyanide. And uh, they had no idea what it was. Cyanide's not in the standard tox screen at most hospitals, right? They couldn't figure out why this formerly healthy woman was uh, showing all these bizarre symptoms. And before they could figure it out, she died. And the her husband had so clearly thought he was going to get away with this. When, the, when this whole thing broke apart, one of the things that really nailed him was that he had bought the cyanide on his university credit card, right? I mean, is that just stupid and arrogant or what? But anyway, the way they figured this out is she died. They had done all of these blood draws. They had no idea what was going on. They weren't looking for cyanide. And when they got the blood analysis back, there was a super high level of lactic acid in her blood, right? And everyone knows lactic acid lactic acid, it's the thing that gives you that burn in your muscles when you over-exercise, right? And you get that. Your muscles are deprived of oxygen, and lactic acid is a response to that oxygen deprivation in the muscles. So lactic acid tells you you've got a massive oxygen deprivation going on when you're seeing it at these super high levels, right? The doc in question actually said, why was this woman who wasn't even exercising showing this phenomenal level of lactic acid? What are the things that cause that? And because cyanide is a suffocator, it starves the mus muscles of oxygen, right? It actually is one of the things that will gin up that level. After they saw the lactic acid, they ran a test for cyanide, among other things, lethal level of cyanide in the blood right? I mean, it's really a beautiful chemical way of solving a problem. But so that's one way you can nail someone. And that guy's in jail now, by the way. So happy ending all, not a happy ending, but you know, some kind of justice. Hi, I'm Iris. Um, what do you think is the most interesting poison that you've looked at throughout your whole entire handbook? Oh, that's a good question. I love arsenic. That's just me. I love arsenic because um, it's a really important poison in our homicidal history, right? Used by everyone from the Borgias to into the early 20th century. People were still, you know, methodically killing people with arsenic. It, um, it's probably the cause of the death of Napoleon, but uh, not for homicidal reasons, right? But it's also a wonderful example of two other things. It's a naturally occurring element. Um, so it's caused all kinds of incredible environmental problems. Um, the, you know, an example of that is in Bangladesh back in the uh, 1960s and 70s when they were having a real problem with surface water contamination. Uh, WHO went in and drilled a bunch of wells, right, two wells, so they could get nice clean groundwater instead of bacterially contaminated surface water. Uh, and they hadn't done a geological survey, and so they hadn't realized that the aquifer under Bangladesh sits under one of the most arsenic-dense rock formations in the world. And so seriously, within a decade or two, they started seeing these really strange diseases popping up in Bangladesh. Um, here's a population that primarily eats rice and fish and vegetables, and they were seeing heart disease, diabetes, cancers of some of the digestive system. And it took them probably another decade or two to realize that what they were seeing was the arsenic, right? These NWHO now calls the Bangladesh situation the greatest mass poisoning of, in human history, right? It's like over 30 million people show some sign 
of exposure to arsenic poisoning. And what the other thing to me that's interesting about that is that it also demonstrates one of the very fascinating things to me when you look at toxicology, which is that arsenic in a homicidal sense, we're talking about, you know, one to two teaspoons of arsenic will kill you, right? That's acutely poisonous. But arsenic in the Bangladesh sense is low dose toxicology. And at that level, we're talking about, you know, arsenic, the EPA limit for arsenic in drinking water is 10 parts per billion. And that was an economic compromise. A lot of people thought it should have been five. In Bangladesh, it's much higher. It can go up to a thousand parts per billion, but still that's really small, right? And what that what they've been able to realize is that arsenic at the low dose behaves differently and damages the body in a really different way. It's pretty, when you get down to low dose toxicology, arsenic, for instance, will really do a number on cells in the cardiovascular system. No one thought that would happen. That was not anything they thought. All the toxicology was based on the high dose. So arsenic's a poster child for a poison kind of being fascinating in all these different ways and, and uniquely woven into human history. So, I, I mean, I sound like an arsenic fan girl here, but it really is an interesting poison. Any other questions? Or time for any other questions? Uh, hi. Uh, what is one of the hardest poisons to detect and why? Oh, that's a good question. So a poison that it's, they're all good questions to me, obviously. Uh, but the, a poison that is hard to detect is a poison that is toxic at an extremely low level. And so some poisons are so acutely toxic, right, that they'll kill at a level that instruments can, actually can't pick up, right? Everyone loves those and they're, and they're the stuff of spy movies. So an example of that until recent years, was the poison ricin. Uh, there was a there's a big mythology about ricin which comes from Breaking Bad. I don't know if anyone ever saw the part of Breaking Bad where it's like, oh, I'm just gonna make some homegrown mm -hmm. ricin. Um, that that's really like ridiculous, right? Ricin, good poisonous ricin is hard to make. And swallowing ricin is not really all, as bad for you as a good poisoner might hope. The way that it is most effective is injected. If you inject it, it's so poisonous in such a tiny amount that they can't detect it directly, even now, right? They can do, they can find like in, enzymatic changes, right? Things that change in your body that suggest that the enzymes have, been, have responded to ricin, but it's actually almost a non-detectable poison, right? Um, so that kind of thing is hard to find. The other thing is that, um, you know, some poisons, we just, we use them so rarely that even though they're detectable, we don't always look for them, right? There was a wonderful poisoning, she says, uh, and this one got caught, so I guess it wasn't as wonderful in that, but there's a uh, plant called the monk's hood, uh, which makes a, a poison called aconitine. And aconitine, um, until the mid 20th century, was, was really one of the most po poisonous things known. It's actually in the Greek myth, Cerberus, the, go the dog that guards the gates to hell. He drools on the ground. This plant grows from the drool of Cerberus. It's a monk's hood plant. It's like a phenomenally poisonous thing. Um, we don't look for that, right? If you get suddenly sick, right, no one's going to say, oh, I'll bet that's a conatine. So the other thing that can be tricky with poisons is, you know, can I find something that is just so off the spectrum that they're never going to look for it, right? And sometimes you are lucky with that, and sometimes the woman who used this in London you know, didn't get away with it for minutes. So uh, that was just good detective work more than toxicology, though. Hi, my name is Emery. Um, so just a quick question, kind of some uh, in regards to like any historical stuff that you... Um, ran across in writing your book about like what was I'm just thinking what was like what do you think the 
the gangs and the gang members level of knowledge in regards to a lot of the stuff was like, did they just, I mean, cause uh, you know, it seemed like um, what I'm hearing in the, you know, what you're talking about, it's like some things according to like, because the general public didn't really know too much as far as how dangerous they were. But then in certain contexts, like even these gang members, you know, took hold of that and knew that and then used it to their advantage. I was just kind of wondering like, if you ran across, like, did they have anyone like even more chemistry inclined than what uh, law enforcement did on their side? Or uh, anyways, I don't know. You can run. with. Yeah, no, course. that's an interesting question. So one of the ways there was some very effective use of poisons uh, um, by criminal organizations and, and they would basically pick ones that I mean, but the poisoner, unlike a, a, a poison, is always a premeditated crime. And then I'll give you a real specific example, right? Uh, if you look at any other weapon that we might use to kill someone, we can use that impulsively, right? A gun, a knife, a brick, a baseball bat, a, anything like that, right? It can be anger, fear, impulse, rage, you know, rage, anger, um, a mistake. But poisoners plan, right? So and and so they're unique among killers. They always have to plan ahead. What what poison am I going to use? What are, what's the delivery system, right? What am I going to do to uh, disguise what it is? Disguise its taste, right? Cyanide's a very bitter poison. Arsenic's a very tasteless poison. So you're always sort of making those calculations, and you see this if you actually listen to interviews with poisoners, right? They plan. Uh, to me, they're uh, some of the scariest killers, right? Because they're so methodical and cold in the way they think about their crimes. Um, and you certainly see this in criminal gangs, especially in the early, late 19th, early 20th, when poisoning was more common. Um, because we didn't have a full-fledged science of toxicology. You know, they would carefully pick the ones that were less detectable. They would, you know, put them in different delivery systems, right? I mean, it's really interesting looking at the newspapers of the time. But one of the times where you really saw how sort of chemically aware these guys were was during Prohibition in the 19th century. I mean, the early 1920s. And, and that's because during the 1920s, right, in 1918, we passed the ridiculous 18th Amendment that makes it illegal to do commerce with um, drinking alcohol and everyone, all the liquor, big liquor businesses shut down and everyone starts drinking illegally. I mean, that's what happened in Prohibition, right? And, uh, and you can go back and look at sort of the sociology of that and realize that a lot of these criminal gangs really be, became powerful and wealthy during Prohibition. It was hugely profitable for the Al Capones of the world. What happened was, as the government starts realizing that this is happening, I mean, in New York, from 1920 to 1930, people opened 30,000 speakeasies, these little illegal joints where you could drink secretly and illegally, right? I mean, it was a phenomenal flood of alcohol. The big, the big criminal gangs, what they would do is they would most, they would make some of their own, but they would steal industrial alcohol. Industrial alcohol is also usually made with grain, but they'll add different contaminants to it, right, so that it's not drinkable. The kind of things you might use for, um, you know, alcohol used in engines or in solvents or perfumes. I mean, all of those are not alcohols we're going to drink, right? Uh, what happened was the government then went to the makers of industrial alcohol, and the criminal gangs like Al Capone, they were stealing 60 million gallons of industrial alcohol a year. And then they were hiring chemists and they would have the chemists get these impurities out. So the stuff was marginally drinkable. They dye it, label it rum or brandy or whatever and schlep it out. The government comes back in to the makers and they go, we want you to make that really poisonous. And we want you to use wood alcohol or eth methanol, which is super poisonous. And this launched this spade of deaths and blindness methanol the way we metabolize it when we when, if you metabolize ethanol which is what we drink when we have a beer or wine or whatever um it eventually breaks down to carbon dioxide and water it's very harmless if you metabolize methanol wood alcohol tastes just the same you get the same buzz it metabolizes to formaldehyde and formic acid and so the government had these industrial alcohol makers 
pour wood alcohol into the product to see if, if making alcohol more poisonous would make people stop drinking. And it didn't. In fact, what it meant was tens of thousands, ten, at least a good 10,000 people died as a result of this. The bootleggers hired more chemists to try to get this out. The government hired more chemists to try to make the alcohol more poisonous. And I wrote a piece for Slate uh, called The Chemist's War, which is what it was called at the time. Bootlegger chemists, government chemists, all trying to figure out ways to put bad things into alcohol, to get it out of alcohol, right? It was a phenomenally scientifically savvy kind of confrontation between uh, a criminal business and government enforcement agents. It's really a fascinating story. Long answer to your question, but I hope that made sense. Absolutely fascinating. Wonderful. Hi, my name is Allie. Hi, um, you Allie. mentioned you, you were a chemistry major in college. Uh, how did you get into science journalism? Well, if you go to my, I need to update my author's website. If you go to my website, you know, I talk about my spectacular crash and burn as a chemistry major in which I generated a toxic cloud and they had to evacuate my laboratory in Florida State and then set my hair on fire. It was a really exciting year for me and, and everyone in my class. Um, <laughs> after that, I, I mean, I was just kind of, what am I going to do with myself? I'm not going to be a chemist. I didn't, you know, I really was. And I, and in this very random way, I thought, well, you know, I like to write. I want to get paid. I've always been real practical. I'll go into journalism. Uh, and so I switched my major to journalism in a, in a kind of unenthusiastic way. Right. And then, uh, loved it. Right. Just loved it. I love, uh, I like to know how things work. And I, um, I like the puzzle of finding out things that other people don't want me to know. And I hate to be told no. That's like ingrained in my personality. Journalists get told no all the time. And then you try to figure out your way around it. So it, I had this instant growing love affair with journalism. But after I had worked for about three papers, I thought, but I want to write about something that matters to me. So I quit my job. I was working um, for a newspaper down in St. Pete, Florida. And uh, I called, quit my job and went to graduate school in science writing. Right. And I was pretty lucky because McClatchy newspapers out in California hired me right out of school, right, as an untested, unknown science writer. And I worked there. I worked in California for about 15 years before I went off into sort of this weird mix of academia and freelancing that I do now. I wouldn't call it a planned career, right? But it has been really fun. And, you know, and I kind of love an unplanned career where you're always going, I can't believe someone pays me to do this, which I say to myself even now. So uh, that sounded pretty chirpy, but that was sort of the path of it. And science writers take all kinds of different paths. You know, uh, there's a great graduate science writing program here at MIT. A lot of those guys are, had got their undergraduate degree in science and then decided they wanted to become science writers, right? So you can come at it from all kinds of different directions. It's a great career for someone who likes science, but uh, uh, has a short attention span, right? Or wants to come at it for all different ways. Um, it's challenging, but it is, like I said, never boring. Hi, my name's Emily. Hi, Emily. I'm wondering, how do you choose which chemicals you write about? You know, it's really, uh, for me, partly the ones that interest me or when I'm writing uh, or I see a, a story that I think needs illumination. There are not that many uh, science writers who are sort of popular science writers like I am who geek out over chemical formulas the way I do, right? So sometimes I'll literally say to myself, this is the sentence I use, if you're going to call yourself a chemistry writer, Deborah, you have to write about this. So I did, for instance, um, a couple of years ago, there was a, a big uh, upset and, and a justified scandal at UC Davis out in California when they'd had some students, uh, they were doing Occupy, 
uh, protest and and they were just you know hammered with pepper spray it was it, like they had these very dramatic scenes of the uc davis police you know sort of sitting the students are sitting on the ground and they're just soaking them with pepper spray so i said to myself well if you're going to call yourself a chemistry writer deborah you need to look at the chemistry of pepper spray uh, that was probably one of the uh, most viral things I ever did in my entire life. I actually, I was so angry about the fact that they were using that that way. And I thought most people didn't know anything about what's the chemical structure, what are the compounds that go into commercial grade pepper spray. And so I actually spent a whole Sunday, I never got out of my pajamas, right? I got, sat down on my laptop at home, wrote this piece called About Pepper Spray, which is about the Scovilles scale that they use for hotness, but also the chemistry of pepper spray. And I went into Google Scholar and I looked at all this research into pepper spray, wrote this about pepper spray piece, posted it on my blog. It got picked up on Scientific American the next day. So Monday, Scientific American. And on Tuesday, I was talking about it on Rachel Maddow. It was pretty insane. And that was the kind of thing where I'm like, I you, need, you need a chemistry writer, right? You need someone who says, if you're going to call yourself a chemistry writer. I've done that a couple times. I did that after the chemistry spill in West Virginia, where I really drilled down into the chemistry of those compounds um, and was slightly dismayed. It's not that I don't like people to admire my work, but uh, in the course of that, what I noticed is, say, at the Washington Post, they would be, and if you want to know more about the chemistry, go read Deborah's stuff at Wired. And I would think to myself, but you should be doing this too, right? You can't only have one person doing this. Um, so, so some of it for me is news events. Some of it is people will write me or call me or could you do this? And if I think there's a story in it, I occasionally do that. And for Poison Pen with the New York Times, it's a long discussion between me and my editor, right? Um, just to give you one really quick example, um, I did a piece for them on BPA, and when I took the job at the Times, they said, just to let you know, literally my editor said, just to let you know, the Times doesn't really believe BPA is a major problem, so don't get all obsessive about it, and I said, okay, yeah, BPA is like so overcovered, I'm not that interested anyway, um, but I started seeing this really interesting pattern of studies with BPA and female rep reproduction, and I followed mm -hmm. it probably for a couple of months, you know, just looking and starting to realize that there were some very good replication, right, that you could actually make a solid case of scientists right down to mechanism, that there were people who actually were starting to pick apart the, the chemical mechanism by which BPA might affect not all reproductive system, but female in particular, really some brilliant work at the University of Illinois. And so, uh, and mechanism is really interesting to me, right? If someone says, you know, there's an association between coffee and wakefulness, right? Then what's the mechanism, right? How does caffeine work? <laughs> So, um, right. So uh, I went to my editor. I said, you know, I really think if I do this narrow focus, just looking at this, there's a credible path. And that's interesting to me. And I'm going to track it along. And I did. I wrote, they published my piece on this very precise kind of part of the BPA story that I thought had some validity. So sometimes for me, it's just I'll follow the scientists to the point, <coughs> science itself to the point that I go, I haven't seen that. And that's a story that I want to write. Hmm. Any other questions? You have a question? I have one very obscure question. Obscure. obscure. Okay. That fits right in. My name is Dave Delvac, and I, I'm a teacher here. And I have a very obscure question about a specific poison that was used. It, in the Jim Jones at, uh, mass suicide in Guyana, the one thing I noticed, and I don't know, I don't know why, it, it may be a simple answer, but every one of the individuals that, that I saw in pictures was laying face down, in other words, on their stomach, after right. taking this poison, was that is that some symptom or indication of the type of poison, or is that were they told to lay down face down as the poison took place? That that that's, was that's a curiosity I have, and I've not been able to find anybody who remotely has an answer to that. 
Yeah, that is a really interesting question to which I'm going to probably give you an inconclusive answer. My understanding was that the primary poison that was put in the Kool-Aid in that Jim Jones case was cyanide. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very fast acting convulsive poison. Um, and the fact that you saw the bot and they could very well because that, you know, that poison, um, there's, I mean, there's some characteristic things that happen with the cyanide poisoning. You can get a convulsive effect. You know, people start choking and gasping for air. Um, and, and they'll sometimes, you know, throw themselves around a little bit, depending on how the poison there's a, you get a contraction of the muscles in the throat that will sometimes produce what's called a cyanide scream. It's, it's not a nice, I mean, not that any poison is nice, but it, you know, it's a fast acting, uh, acutely nasty poison. So I have never seen that explained well either. There's nothing about cyanide that if everyone was standing up that would predict this. That makes me think that either they were told to lie down, but there would, again, if they did that, there would be nothing that would predict they would all end up face down, right? Cyanide doesn't necessarily, it, you might roll over, but who knows where you'd end up, right? And so that makes me think that they were carefully posed, right? That not everyone died, not everyone died in that mass poisoning, right? And um, that the people who didn't die, that, you know, Jones and his posed the bodies, right? Rolled them all over face down, sending some kind of a kind of uniform reaction, incredibly creepy message, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Does that, mm -hmm. is that helpful at all? And I haven't seen any documentation that supports that, but that would be my just knowing, you know, from what I would think about the way the body responds to cyanide, that would be the thing that would at least make the most sense to me. So this is uh, Desmond. Um, so a student and I back here were thinking that interview with poisoners is a good reality show. Yes, it would be pretty interesting, <laughs> right? And and all of, I mean, poisoners always have a good story, right? I mean, yes. Has, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've often wanted, if when I go into the FBI statistics, you know, the FBI does the homicide statistics, uh, and I'll look at some of the poisonings, and I think, oh, I wish I knew the backstory on that. So far, the FBI hasn't let me <laughs> read their interview, right? But I would love to see that. So... I love well, that. Idea. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is truly one of the most fascinating seminars. <laughs> That's yep. <laughs> well, they were great questions. Thank you all very much for having me on. <laughs>